thank you for having me here. As uh, David mentioned, it's um, I'm in Arizona, so it's early morning for me, about eight o'clock. So if I seem a little groggy, it's because I just woke up. <laughs> you guys are just ending your day, but uh, time zones are fun. <clears throat> um, so today I'm going to be speaking about creating communities, uh, sorry, communities of learning online and how it differs from um, how it works in face-to-face -face classrooms. Before I do that, though, let me uh, just give you a little bit of my background. So David mentioned already that I have a PhD in uh, educational technology from Arizona State University. That's also where I work. Um, I work as an educational technologist helping faculty members put uh, courses online and training faculty. And I also administer our Canvas LMS for our college. There are multiple colleges at Arizona State, so a lot of stuff involved there. Um, I've been involved with the TESOL International Association for more than 20 years now, I think. Um, I'm a former board member. Um, and I know David mentioned IATEFL, and I, there was always sort of some competition between IATEFL and the TESOL International Association. Um, but um, for me, at least, the TESOL International Association is really a, a second home, and it's a great community of like-minded um, teachers. And I find a lot of uh, resources and ideas there. So if, and it doesn't have to be the TESOL International Association, but I would highly encourage you uh, to join a, a professional organization and find the community of teachers that you can work with. Um, as David mentioned, I've written several books and ch book chapters about teaching online and language learning. The 100 Ways to Teach Language I was a co-author on. Uh, sorry, it's 100 Ways to Teach Language Online, and that's basically a bunch of different um, activities and things that you can use in online settings to, to teach various aspects of language. The other book, 50 Ways to Teach Online, is sort of tips for online teaching in general and doesn't really focus specifically on language um, ideas, but more on things like class, classroom management, creating effective discussion boards, and, and things like that. So, if you're interested in those, you can find out more information on my website, which is jshuel.com, and I'll have that at the end of the presentation for you. Um, I'm a co-designer of Teach English Now, which David mentioned. It's one of the largest online um, ESOL certificate programs. There are, I think, about 600,000 people now that have gone through it. It's a series of eight courses. It's a, it's a MOOC, a massive open online course. So it's a little different than the typical online teaching context, but I'll mention a few examples from that in our discussion today. And last but not least, I'm the father of five children. Uh, my youngest is now a senior in high school. So uh, my others are uh, you know, in college or, or grown, but uh, they kept me busy for many a year. So I wanna make sure I mention them. <laughs> As part of our uh, discussion today, I'm gonna to be asking you a couple questions. And so if you would like to join and participate by giving me your responses, I'm gonna be using an app called Socrative. So you can join my Socrative room, that's what it's called, the room. Uh, you can join my room by scanning this QR code that's right here or going to this URL. If you go to the bottom URL, it will ask you for a room name, and that is the name of my room, EFTeach23. So I'll give you guys a minute to those that are, want to, to join. And if the room's not working, please let me know. But, all right, so I can see we've got seven people in there now. All right. So, on your screen, your phone, whatever you're using to join the room, you're gonna see a list of choices, A, B, C, D, or E. Okay, don't choose one yet because I haven't shown you the question, obviously. All right, so here is the question that I would like you to answer. Which do you think is the most important for students in online learning? Go ahead and just hit tap A, B, C, D, or E on whatever device you're using. We should see the answers come through here. It's working right. 
And I just check, sorry to interrupt, Justin. I think a couple uh, of people are joining from the link. And then they, if they join the link, they need to put EFTeach23 as the room name. Is that right? Yes. Uh, the link at the bottom, the one that says be a student. Um, I don't have it in front of me anymore, but I'll put that link back up. There you go. B.socrative.com login student. If you use that one, it'll ask for the room name. That's the room name, EFTeach23, which you guys can't see because I'm on Chrome right now. There we go. <laughs> If you use this URL right here, the top one, uh, it should go straight to the room, or if you scan the QR code. All right, so if you're in the room, are you seeing the A, B, C, D, E? Yes, I am. All right, so if you, you can just tap your answer. There we go. One person answered so far. <laughs> I don't think I've ever done this online. I usually do it in the classroom. So <laughs> I think we're possibly just seeing the results rather than the actual question. If you answered, then you'll you'll see the results. But oh, I see. If that's you right. have right. if you haven't answered already, if you just tap, you should see choices A, B, C, or D. And you're probably waiting for the question again, since I took it off. There's the question. Those are the choices. Computer skills is A, connection with the teacher, B, connection with other students, C, or internet connection, D, or E, connection to the content or curriculum. So which of those do you think is the most important? All right, now we're getting some other answers coming in. I'll go back and forth a little bit. So we've had seven people answer, and you can see that, uh, oh, D is winning out right now. Put the choices back up one more time. Okay. Well, so far it looks like D is winning out there. And um, obviously an internet connection is very important for online learning. Um, the things that I wanna focus on today, and I'll give you a little bit of background why in a minute, but the things that we're gonna focus on today are gonna to be these three things, connection with the teacher, connection with other students and connection to the content or curriculum. So let me give you a little bit of background on that. Um, if you think about your Psych 101 class that you might have taken at university or maybe a beginning teacher training class, you've probably heard of Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. If not, I'll give you a brief refresher. So it's a period, a pyramid, sorry, and it's designed such that in order to reach the top, which is self-actualization, which is obviously where we want to be, um, we have to have met the needs at the other levels first. So the first level is physiological needs, things like air. Um, I think there was a, a motivational speaker who said, you know, when you're drowning, you don't care about anything else except your next breath. Um, and so that kind of illustrates that point there. Um, but once you've got those needs met, then the next thing you'll care about will be your safety, your health, uh, having a good secure job so that you can buy food and keep those physiological needs met, et cetera. And then we move up to love and belonging, and then esteem, and then finally to self-actualization. Um, and this is used widely in education uh, for various, um, to justify various pedagogical things and other things that we do when we're teaching. So I took Maslow's hierarchy of needs and I created what's called Shul's hierarchy of online learning needs. And as most people pointed out in our poll, um, Internet connection is obviously very important. If you don't have an internet connection or a device, you can't really access online learning. So equipment needs are there at the bottom. Um, and then the next 
um, level is the environment, a place where students can go, where they can have it quiet and calm, where there's no distractions so that they can learn. Okay. And obviously those two things are very important. And the reason, um, so those two things have to be met before we can move on. However, I do find that most teachers don't have control over these two things with their students. So they may be different for you, but in general, online teachers don't have control over what type of equipment their students have. They don't have control over their students' internet connection. Um, and they don't have control over their home environment or wherever they're learning because the teachers aren't there with the students. You're not creating the environment yourself. You are, the students are doing it. So even though those two things are really important, there's not much influence the teachers can have on those. So I'm focusing on the next level, which is community and interaction, because this is one where I think teachers can do quite a bit to influence um, and fulfill the needs of their students at this level. Now, I don't want to leave you hanging and not show you what the last two are. So I'll go through those really quick before we move on to talk about community and interaction. Um, so the fourth level is self-reliant. Students need to be autonomous, self-starters. They need to be able to solve their own problems because the teacher's not there to solve their problems for them. And then finally, the top level for me is creativity. And um, I think a lot of, well, nowadays I'm not so sure. A lot of um, a lot of incoming teachers, you know, younger teachers have grown up with technology, so they might not see technology um, the same way that I do, because uh, I'm old. Um, but in my experience, when I was a younger teacher, a lot of the online activities, online things that we did, weren't very creative. They were rote learning, practicing grammar and vocabulary words, etc. But I think there's a lot of opportunities to bring creativity into online learning. So that's why I put it at the top level. That's a little bit of background why I want to talk about community and interaction. So we're talking about learning communities. And um, learning communities are not new. They've been around for a long time. Um, in there, they exist, of course, in both face-to-face -face classrooms and online classrooms. Um, and so some of the research, earlier research on learning communities, I found this quote that I really liked. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole thing for you, but I want to point out some specific characteristics of learning communities that this quote highlights. So one of the first things that I think learning communities do is they provide opportunities for students to have deeper understanding and a better integration of the material that they're learning. They also allow for more interaction and they allow the teacher to interact as a fellow participant uh, with the learners. So those are a couple of important um, characteristics of learning communities. All right, we're gonna go back to our Socrative room. Let me finish this activity and launch a new one. All right, so if you're in the room, you should still, you should now see A, B, C, D, E again. I'm going to give you a different question, obviously. Okay, um, let me go back to slides. All right, so here's the question. Which do you think is the most important element in a learning community? So A is a feeling of membership in the group. B is influence over others in the group. C is positive relationships with the group. D is having needs met by the group, and E as shared experiences with the group. I'll give you a minute to look at those and make your choice. All right, kind of a going between A and E there. Um, I agree with both of those. Actually, I agree with all of them. <clears throat> In truth, they're all important, but obviously which one you think is the most important, that's a, a personal uh, opinion. So, but I wanna talk about the elements of a community and how, um, and how we can influence that. So, Um, two well-known psychologists in the field of community building and research, their names are Macmillan and Chavez, in 1986 
um, in a uh, paper, article, whatever you want to call it, that they wrote, um, talked about the sense of community and sort of defined it. So they stated, they stated that um, participants of a learning community must feel some sense of loyalty and belonging to the group. Um, and that drives their desire to keep working and helping others in the group. And they call that membership. So uh, the, the person in the community has a right to belong because they have invested a part of themselves in that community. They also stated that for a community to work, the things that participants do must affect what happens in the community. That means it's an active relationship, not just a reactive relationship. And they call this influence. So not having power over others in the group per se, but the things that they do have some influence in the group and they also are influenced by other members of the group. They also stated that a learning community must give a chance to the participants to meet particular needs, right? If the, if the students aren't feeling rewarded by being in that community, they're not going to stay. So those needs could be a variety of different things. It might be the you know sharing their personal opinions or asking for help, getting specific information. Um, but whatever those needs are, um, they need to be met for uh, the community to work. And finally, as was mentioned in E, they need to have a connection and share emotional experiences, positive emotional experiences and interactions that sort of develop this sense of togetherness and um, connected identity. So when you look at these elements of a community, it really doesn't matter if the members of the community are in close proximity to each other or if they're spread across the globe, as long as those elements exist. Obviously, it happens much easier and more readily when we're in an in-person classroom or at a club meeting or whatever it happens to be. We almost don't have to think about it in those cases. However, in an online setting, this begs the question then, how do we build communities uh, in online learning when we don't have the face-to-face -face option? Um, and when I talk about online learning, just to be uh, clear, Generally, I'm focusing on what we call asynchronous um, settings. So the students aren't meeting together on Zoom or whatever, WhatsApp, whatever. They're not meeting together and chatting and talking and having class sessions, but everything is happening asynchronously. Um, and yes, it is possible to build online communities of learning in those settings, even though the students never actually meet at the same time. Um, so, Garrison and his partners in 1999 wrote a paper that talked about sort of three presences, they called them, or three lenses that we can look at that um, form a framework of how we can build communities online. So I would like to, to introduce those to you and then go through them. So the first one is called social presence. And they define this as the ability of participants in a community to project themselves socially and emotionally as real people and be able to share their personalities with other members of the group. The next one they called cognitive presence. And this is the level at which the students uh, connect to the content uh, and the level at which they think critically about what they're learning and how they can apply it in meaningful ways. And the last one is called teaching presence. This is the feeling that there's somebody guiding them through the lecture or through the materials. They're not just working uh, through them on their own. Sort of the difference between having a tour guide if you were touring a foreign city and wandering around the city on your own. You still might learn something uh, if you wandered the city on your own, but you learn a lot more with a tour guide and you feel like you had a better travel experience. So as you can see, these uh, circles intersect and overlap because the presences ob obviously intersect with each other. So for example, you can focus on cognitive presence and social presence through online discussion assignments. And you can connect your cognitive and teaching presence by selecting level appropriate content 
uh, et cetera. And we'll talk about each of these uh, in a minute. And of course, all of these presences combine to create the educational experience. So if you're only focusing on social presence or cognitive presence, um, you're not gonna give the full educational experience to your, to your students. So you need to make sure that each one of these is represented in your online teaching. So let's talk about each of them. The first one is social presence. Again, this is the ability of the participants in the community to project themselves socially as real people and to share their personality. So what are some things that teachers can do to develop social presence in online settings? Well, one of the things I recommend is to have a welcome video. Um, this is a, a way for students to make a personal connection with you. Um, they need to see that you're a real person. And it might be scary for some instructors if you've never recorded a video of yourself before. Um, but there's no better way for students to see that you're a real person than to watch you on video introducing yourself in the course. So um, if you have the resources available, making a professional video is great, but even just a video recorded with your smartphone is better than no video at all. Um, I do recommend that you use a microphone. Uh, you can get a cheap one on Amazon for about 30 US dollars. Um, that works great, plugs into a phone or a computer, whatever. Um, it gives you good quality audio, so that's important. Um, and don't worry about being nervous in front of the camera. Um, you can use a teleprompter or cue cards or a script if you want, but people need to see that you're a real person and real people make mistakes. So having a few ums or flubs in your video isn't going to bother anybody, except maybe you. <laughs> Another thing that you can do is share personal stories and interests. Um, Ken Bain, who is an educational author, wrote a book called What the Best College Teachers Do. And he stresses the importance of making a connection with students by sharing personal experiences and interests. So obviously he's referring to college professors lecturing in person, but we can do the same thing in online teaching. Uh, whether we're replying in discussion boards or we're presenting content in the video lecture, um, it's always good to share stories and, and to talk about things that you're interested in. Um, that will let students not only see you as a real person, but also see you for what you really are, an expert in the field who cares about um, their success. I also strongly encourage you to use students' names. Um, again, it seems it uh, seems very simple, but nothing turns a student off more quickly than realizing that the teacher doesn't know who they are and their name. So in an asynchronous setting, there's not as much opportunity to use students' names because you're not referring to the students in third person. You're not talking to them directly, um, speaking usually. Uh, you can, but um, when you're answering their emails, when you're referring to them in discussion boards, make sure to use students' names and uh, this will go a long way in helping them feel engaged. Another suggestion for social presence is to use personal language and uh, I'll call it a warm tone. Um, and this, this is something that teachers do naturally in face-to-face -face context. So it's really easy to make a personal connection with students in a face-to-face -face context because you're looking students in the eye you're talking to them, you're asking questions before and after class, um, you're getting that feedback from them to know if they're connected or not. Uh, that's why doing virtual presentations sometimes is so hard because, you know, I can't see any of you really and I can't tell, you know, or you, you could be on your phone or whatever, I have no idea. Um, in face-to-face -face classrooms, it's really easy to make that connection, but in online settings, we have to work at it. And it's really easy for students to feel isolated. So when you're recording your lectures or when you're um, talking, you know, responding in the discussion boards, et cetera, using uh, personal language, things like um, you and your, um, you know, personal pronouns, et cetera. When you're recording a video, looking directly at the camera as much as you can, these things help the students feel like you're talking to them um, and not to some unknown um, audience. 
And the last one that I'll share is to use humor uh, when appropriate. So students are more engaged when they enjoy the learning experience. And even though you might not like to think of yourself as an entertainer, keeping students entertained really is part of the job of the teacher. Um, because even the most boring, even the most interesting content can become boring if students are bored or dull. So uh, I've seen teachers though go too far the other way where they use too much fun or they play too many games and all the students remember is the games and the fun. They don't really learn anything from them. So you have to make sure that you're finding a balance and that the humor and the games are, are appropriate for whatever the content that you're doing is. Um, but it's important to remember the power of humor and use it when you can to keep things interesting and engaging. Um, I have, uh, well, you guys, this is a global audience, so you probably realize this more than um, some of the audiences I work with in the U.S., but one thing to keep in mind when you're online, uh, when you're teaching online, is you might have students from all over the world, so you want to make sure that you avoid cultural references and things uh, from your culture that a student from a different culture might not understand. So let's talk about teaching presence now. And teaching presence is the feeling, again, that there's someone guiding the learners through the materials, that they're not just working through them all on their own. So one of the ways that you can develop this teaching presence in your course is to make sure that you do regular course announcements. So in a face-to-face -face context, you're meeting with the students, typically, uh, a set time each week, and you're giving updates and announcements, you're working with them, and whether they want to or not, the students are focused on your course and the content for the, that time because they don't have much of a choice. In an asynchronous online setting, there is no set time, they're working on it whenever they want. And so it's really easy for students to get distracted and not, and not do things. And so that regular connection by having regular announcements is a great way to keep students engaged. Um, you, in the announcements, you can include a summary of the week's lectures, a list of assignments that might be coming due, information about resources you've added to the content. Um, you can address students' questions, give updates on the last assignment they submitted, etc. cetera. Um, the point is that you're connecting with the students regularly and you're providing guidance information to help them get through the course. It's also important to have frequent interaction with students. Um, I see this more at the administration level, probably because administrators aren't the ones teaching, but a lot of times you'll see someone, you know, you spend a lot of time developing the course and getting it set up and then like, great, you can handle 500 students. And that's not really the case in online teaching because sometimes it takes even more work than face-to-face -face teaching because of how intentional you have to be in interacting with the students. So you can't just let it run, let the course run on autopilot or anything like that. Um, so you need to be logging in every day um, or regularly at least connecting with the students, responding to questions, participating in the discussion boards, grading, providing feedback, et cetera. This helps students um, feel like they're not alone and like the teacher's there with them. Going along with that, you wanna make sure that you're giving frequent feedback on performance. Um, you know, When students submit an assignment, they shouldn't sit there for a long time before, um, before they receive some type of grade on it. And this helps students feel more motivated um, because they feel that the teacher's aware of them and how they're doing. So, you, your feedback could be in the form of an email or a private message sent through whatever learning management system you're using. Um, it could be just uh, like in Canvas, we have our rubrics that go with our assignments. So it's pretty easy for me to provide feedback to students that way to make comments, et cetera. Um, and if, if you have a large number of students, you might have to focus on automating uh, your common feedback. So this is a, a trick that I learned um, sort of out of necessity, I guess, because I had courses with large numbers of students in them. But after I'd run the course for a while, I started to find that I was saying the same thing to a lot of students regarding specific assignments. So what I did is I took the common comments that I was making and I put them all into 
uh, at the time we didn't have Google Docs, I was using Word, so I put it into a Word doc. And then when I grade, I would go into that Word doc and I'd find the appropriate comment and I would copy and paste the comment into whatever, wherever I was providing feedback for that student, which saved me from having to retype the same thing over and over again. It also allowed me to tailor the comment specifically for that student because I already had the gist of everything there and then I just had to change a few things to make it more personal. Um, so that saved me a lot of time and so that's a trick that I wanted to, to share with you. Um, sometimes your LMSs, like I said, Canvas does this when you click on the rubric, it has the rubric benchmark right there and then you can type a personal comment. Um, so you might be able to use your LMS to do this. Um, but even if you're just using a Word doc and copying and pasting, it still works great. Um, if you spend some time up front drafting high quality feedback comments and statements that are clear and cover the most common types of feedback you give your students, it allows you to go more in depth and be more consistent in the feedback that you provide. Uh, but you do have to make it personal. You can't just copy and paste for everybody. Um, so, but this allows you to do that in less time. And finally, uh, well, for this section anyway, finally for teaching presence, you wanna make sure that you're using data-informed reflective teaching. So um, you wouldn't just record your lectures um, for a face-to-face -face class and then play them and, when the, and just sit there at, at your desk reading while the students watch you on video. Um, you'd be walking around the room, checking, understanding, helping students to have questions. So you need to do the same thing when you're focusing on, on online learning. Um, you might do this with simple quizzes or activities. Um, I put surveys in my classes so students can provide feedback there. Um, I've had times where I realized that the students weren't getting what I needed them to learn. And so I had to sort of change course mid semester and add in extra lectures with further explanations. Um, other times I've had students that were on cruise control, you know, just coasting through the course because it was all too easy. And so I updated assignments and made them a little bit more complex to allow for deeper connections to the content. So those are some things that will help you develop a better teaching presence in, the, in your courses. And the last one that of the presences is cognitive presence. And again, this is the level at which the students connect to the content, which they think critically about what they've learned and how they can apply it in meaningful ways. So one of the things that you can do to develop appropriate or to develop cognitive presence is to select appropriate content for the level that your students are at. Again, it sounds really simple, but a lot of times when students are having trouble completing a course, the problem is that they're trying to learn content that's too advanced for them or learn too much content in the time that they've been given to complete the course. So if you have power over the content that you're teaching, you wanna be very deliberate, uh, deliberate and careful in how you structure the course and what learning objectives you include. You might take a face-to-face -face course and actually break it up and make it into multiple online courses because uh, it's, you know, it takes longer for the students to grasp the concepts online, et cetera. You might also take difficult content and break it into smaller chunks that they can handle more easily. Um, a lot of times in online settings, you have students coming from various different backgrounds. And so they have different levels of background knowledge and experience. And so you might have to provide supplemental materials in order to bring them up to the level so that they can understand the content that you're trying to teach. Um, think of Vygotsky, Vygotsky's um, Zone of Proximal Development or Krashen's I plus one. Another tip is to provide multiple interactions with the content. Um, again, it seems really simple, but learning occurs in steps and very rarely does one a learner, very rarely are learners able to construct new knowledge and meaning in just one sitting or a lesson. You need to interact with the, the content multiple times, each time approaching it from a slightly different angle. So as you plan your course structure, don't forget the importance of revisiting previously taught concepts and recycling content into new contexts. So for example, you might present your students with a problem 
sometimes called a triggering event, then students have to explore the content you provided to find ways to solve the problem or complete the challenge. And during this process, they're inquiring, they're exploring, reflecting on what they've learned, they share their ideas with their classmates and brainstorm solutions. And then finally, they apply what they've learned to create a solution which they present to others along with clear reasons and opinions. So if you have your courses structured in a way that the assignments are progressive with the first easier assignments naturally leading to more complex assignments, then students will be able to naturally interact with the content in, uh, multiple times. This goes right along with the next tip, which is to use launch or the design thinking process. So Dr. John Spencer uses the word launch to talk about design, seek, design thinking. That's launch, L-A-U-N-C-H, not lunch. Lunch was a few hours ago for you guys. Um, the design thinking process is a way for that um, for students to integrate creativity and flexibility into the assignments. So the reason he uses the word launch, the L stands for look, listen, and learn. And this is where students become aware of a problem that needs to be solved. The A stands for ask questions, and the U stands for understanding key concepts. So in those two go together. And at this part in the process, the students are gathering all the information that they can um, about the problem. The N stands for navigating ideas. And this is where students use the information that they have gathered to formulate ideas um, uh, of possible solutions, sort of the brainstorming process. The C stands for creating a prototype. And here the students will build the first iteration of their solution. It might be something physical that they produce. They might organize an event. They might create some type of a system or even create art. It just depends on whatever they come up with. The H stands for highlight and fix. And this is where students will get feedback on their prototype and then improve upon it as many times as they need to in order until they're satisfied with the results. Then they launch it into the real world where they get feedback in real uh, in real context. And they might go back to the beginning and start all over again, or they might just keep iterating uh, and fixing their prototype and making it better. Another tip for developing cognitive, pre cognitive presence is to include reflection assignments. So reflection is an essential, essential part of learning. Um, and a reflection assignment could be something like a regular journal entry that they're writing each week or each after each lesson where they record what they learned and how they felt about it. Um, you might include a reflection piece at the end of a project or an assignment where students self-evaluate their work. So at one of my projects, um, when before they submit it to me, they have to take the grading rubric that I use and they have to give themselves a grade based on that rubric and they have to explain why they gave themselves that grade. Um, that's just a chance for them to reflect on how they did uh, and how they and, and the process that they used. So reflection assignments help students realize that learning is a deliberate interactive process. And of course, we all know the importance of critical thinking skills, um, but students really need to learn from us how to think, not really what to think, but how to think, so that they can handle the things that we can't anticipate in the future. Um, if we design our assignments and our interactions so that they encourage students to think critically, then we'll develop those critical thinking skills. Sometimes it could be something as simple as giving them a choice in an assignment. Well, you know, if you have an assignment where they have to present an argument, they might have the choice to write an essay or do a presentation or create a play or whatever it might be. Um, but they have to think critically about those choices and make a decision, even though the purpose of the assignment is still the same. They're just presenting their ideas in different ways. All right. I have one last question for you. So let me go here and launch a new activity. All right. 
still have people in the room, good. All right, so here's the question. Which types of interaction are most important in online teaching? A, students are logging in every day. B, discussion assignments. C, office hours with the instructor. D, students reading course announcements or B, group project, or sorry, E, group project assignments. I'll give you a second to look at those, see which one you think is most important. Looks like discussion assignments are winning out. You've probably realized by now that all of them are important in different <laughs> in different contexts. Um, uh, and they're each important in different ways. So when we think of online learning, a lot of people will think of discussions, but there are actually uh, three types of interactions in uh, well, three types of interactions and learning. Again, it applies to online learning as well. So uh, Moore in 1989 published a paper called Three Types of Interactions. And it wasn't specifically focused in online um, learning, but it, it was published in the American Journal of Distance Education. But the three types of interactions that he proposed were uh, learner to learner interactions, learner to content interactions, and learner to instructor interactions. So I'd like to talk about each of these and how we can uh, focus on them and improve the, the opportunities for interactions in our online courses. How are we doing on time? Excuse me, you're, you're good. You have a, a good another 10 minutes, Justin. Okay. I'll go through this quickly because I want to leave some time for questions. So, all right. Um, so first, interaction doesn't just happen, especially learner to learner interaction in asynchronous settings. So we have to create the opportunities for this to happen. We have to be deliberate about it. And the opportunities need to be throughout the entire course. We don't want just one opportunity at the beginning of the course and then the students never have other opportunities to interact. So make sure that they're doing it throughout the course. Some ways that you can create these opportunities, you might have an introduction assignment where students are recording a video of themselves or um, you know, posting in a discussion board, introducing themselves to you and to the other students. It's a great way for students to just be able to share some of their interests, et cetera. Um, I always try to provide a space for off-topic discussions. Um, a lot of the conversations that happen in face-to-face -face settings where students build those relationships, they're not talking about things from the course. But in online settings, especially asynchronous ones, the students won't talk about off-topic things because it doesn't relate to the topic of the discussion. So having a space for those things to happen is a, a great way to encourage that learner-to-learner -learner interaction. Um, and you also can organize your students into groups or cohorts so that then they have uh, people that they can work with on assignments, et cetera. Um, and this is a great way to encourage learner-to-learner -learner interaction. And there's lots of different ways to create groups. You might do it by their names or uh, in Canvas, you can randomly assign people to groups um, or you could have them self, you know, just have them pick, you know, they might find a student going through the introductions, find a st students that they like and they might choose to form their own groups, however you decide to do it. And then I strongly encourage you to design assignments that require them to collaborate. Um, typically, if you want students to collaborate, you have to make the assignments complex enough that they have to collaborate to complete them, that they can't do it on their own. Um, so if you're using the launch process uh, for an assignment, that's a good example of a complex assignment. Um, but again, it takes intentionality. For learner to content interaction, again, this is the connection to the, to the content, the how many times they're interacting with the content. And obviously they need to do it multiple times. We talked about that before. So this increases the retention of learning and improves those neural connections in their brain. 
One of the ways that you can help do that is to connect your course to content to social media. So for our Teach English Now courses, we have a Facebook group that has thousands of people in it now. And they're, they're not talking about the course specifically on the Facebook group. They're sharing things like a lesson plan that they developed or um, an article that they found that relates to something that they learned in one of the courses, et cetera. Or sometimes they're just sharing a recent event that happened in their lives, whatever it might be. But it, it gives, the learners are seeing that every day and it gives them a chance to connect back and remember things from the courses. So even though they, they're not in the course now, they finished the courses, they're still on that Facebook group. Um, you can, you know, we can go on there and schedule posts and, and send links and resources that might help students with an upcoming assignment or different things like that. So, and because they're seeing it outside of the course platform, um, it's just a, another way for them to connect with that content. I strongly encourage the use of metaphors to make content relevant. Um, again, it seems really simple, but this is just a good teaching practice, good teaching idea. Um, I'll give you a couple examples from our Teach English Now courses. So in our very, very, very first video, um, my friend Shane, he's the person on camera, he has a chocolate cake and he takes, cuts out a piece of the chocolate cake and he squishes it up in his hands and you can see it, you know, poking through his fingers. And then he puts it on the plate and he hands it, sort of offers it to the camera, said, would you like a piece of cake? And of course, people get all grossed out because he squished it with his hands, even though his hands were clean. So then in the next cut, he goes and cuts another piece of the same cake, exact same cake, he cuts another piece. But this time he puts it on the plate, all nice with a fork and a napkin, and he offers it to the camera. And he says, would you like some cake? And so obviously we're asking the students to, to think about what was it about the first one that they didn't want the cake versus the second one where they did want the cake. The cake was exactly the same, but the way it was presented obviously was different. And that's an important part of teaching is how you present the content. And we had another, I guess, sort of an analogy, I guess. Um, we were talking about how to teach reading. And we wanted to emphasize the idea that you have different types of readers in your classes. And so we used the story of the Wizard of Oz as an analogy to talk about the different types of readers that you would have. Um, and we had the Scarecrow reader and the Tin Man reader and the Cowardly Lion reader. And we had Dorothy going through and meeting each of these readers and having to deal with the different aspects of teaching each of these readers uh, reading. And even in the course assignments, teachers would, uh, you know, and on the Facebook group, Participants would talk about, oh, today I, in my class, I had a scarecrow reader, and, and they would use that analogy to reference back to the things that they learned about how to teach reading to that type of student. So it's a powerful way to connect uh, the learners to the content. Um, Richard Mayer wrote a book called Multimedia Learning, and in his, the book, he talks about his principles of multimedia learning. And then the last ones I'm going to mention are a couple of those. Um, Principles. So the pre-training principle basically states that people will learn a bit more if they're given pre-training. This is basically building up students' background knowledge. So if you haven't, um, if students don't have the background knowledge, they're not going to get the concept. So you need, might need to provide supplemental materials, et cetera, in order to bring students up to the level that they need to be at. Uh, the multimedia principle from Richard Mayer states that people learn better from pictures and words than from words alone. So again, the brain is wired for visual learning. That's why we have that idiom, a picture is worth a thousand words. So uh, use visual representation as much as you can, whether it's videos or images, even music sometimes can help. And finally, remember the interactivity principle, which states that people learn better when they can control the pace of their learning. So this is actually one area where online learning works a lot better because Students are watching videos, they're able to pause, uh, go back, uh, fast forward, watch you on double speed or, or half speed, etc. cetera. Um, and in a lot of asynchronous learning, MOOCs and other things, the, the activities, et cetera, are self-paced. So the, the assignment due dates are flexible, et cetera. So online learning does this really well, but when students can control the pace of their learning, it helps keep them engaged and they have a uh, better connection to the content. And the last one is learner to instructor interact, learner to instructor interaction. 
Um, this is pretty similar to teaching presence. Students need to feel that connection with the teacher. There's a strong correlation with that connection with the teacher with their perceived learning. So when students have a good connection with the teacher, they feel like they learned more. Um, I provide students opportunities to give feedback in my classes. I have a survey at the end of every module that has just three questions. The first question is, what did they like about the module? The second question is, what did they not like about the module? And the third question is open, you know, anything else that they want to tell me. And that has provided me a lot of great information for improving my courses um, and my teaching. So it's important to communicate in multiple ways because not everybody uses email, for example. So um, you might use WhatsApp or through social media, but you need to communicate with your students where your students are. I actually got a Google voice number, um, which it works great because students can call that number and leave a message and then Google voice transcribes the message and sends it to my email. Or if students send a text to that number, then it sends the text to my email. So I get to communicate through email like I like, and the students get to communicate through SMS or, or voice if they like to. So um, if possible, you might wanna consider holding office hours synchronously. That doesn't always work, but if you have the opportunity and the technology to do that, again, Zoom or Skype, whatever works well. And then you wanna make sure that you're addressing your student concerns and announcements, things like, answering their questions or um, you know, covering a difficult assignment that they talked about, et cetera. And the last one for learner to instructor interaction is to prove that you are not a dog. And the phrase not a dog refers to a cartoon in the New Yorker in the 1990s, where you had two dogs sitting in front of a computer and one dog says to the other dog, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. So in a face-to-face -face classroom, the students see you, they know who you are. By the end of the class, they, they, they know who their teacher is. But in the asynchronous online setting, you know, they might not ever hear your voice or see your face. So it's really important to, to you know, make sure you're recording your video lectures with you on camera, at least sometimes that they're hearing your voice, that they know that you're a real person. Um, don't be afraid to show them who you are. So I'd like to remind you of the question I asked at the beginning which do you think is the most important for students in online learning? For me, that answer would be connection. And so I hope you have learned some ways that you can create that connection with your students in your online uh, courses. Thank you. Do we have time for questions, I hope? Absolutely, there are some in the text and thanks for that. I was wondering why that dog was by the questions. Now it all makes sense, <laughs> Justin. You got, you got to the punchline very well. <laughs> Um, uh, we've got a question from, from Petra, I think it's going, going from the bottom upwards. Um, she was asking, how can we motivate regular long-term students, um, and give regular automate feedback? Um, you know, some of them just do something once and then, then don't do it anymore. How can we keep them involved to, to take part and give their feedback? Um, well, I think the regular communication is an important thing. So, you know, um, I've emailed students that haven't submitted assignments for, especially in self-paced where, you know, they're, they don't submit something maybe for months <laughs> in a, in a, in a ongoing course, you know, um, you might communicate with them by email or whatever it is, see how they're doing, check in personally, um, Figuring out what motivates them is really the key there. So it depends on how much, uh, you know, how well you know that student. But if you can figure out something that would motivate them, maybe they need to be, maybe they need that, that personal invitation or they need to be given some responsibility in a group in order to motivate them to do something. I mean, there are, there are lots of different things that you might do depending on the situation. So. Also, I can throw in. I can throw in one for me. I think some people are typing. Uh, Petra says thank you. Um, you mentioned in your in your uh, Shaw's pyramid kind of thing there. You um, I can't remember it precisely, but you had something about group and community, and then you had right at the top um, kind of personal needs. Um, right. And, and I wondered, you know, from what you were saying uh, further about about community, and I think you, you you touched on these areas, but 
Is it a case that you kind of get students to want to forego their personal needs and put the community first? Or do you feel that ultimately they're going to get the more out of it themselves if they if they devote themselves to the, the kind of community's needs? Do you see what I mean? How do they how do you kind of try and persuade them to balance those things? Yeah. Well, I'll go back to the pyramid here. I was trying to get to that slide. Um, that's a great question. And it sort of depends. A lot of the community and whether you put the individual first or the community first is based on the culture that the students come from. So there's a, a theory or a concept in cultural communication called power. And high power cultures um, typically have, um, I think it's power. I might be, that might be the wrong term. But anyway, in some cultures, the community is very important and the group always supersedes the individual. But in other cultures, like US culture, uh, the individual usually supersedes the community. So there's always sort of that, what culture did they come from and how do they feel? Um, the point of this on the pyramid is more that the students feel that connection to, um, you know, very rarely does a student in an in-person class sit there the entire semester or, or session and not, not develop any type of connection with other students with the teacher. It's almost impossible in a face-to-face -face setting when you're sitting there to not develop that connection. I mean, maybe you have that one student that's always the loner and sits at the back of the room. But in online learning, it's almost the opposite. It's almost impossible to develop that community and interaction unless the teacher is providing those opportunities. Um, so the key there is for the students to make some type of connection. They might put the group first and say, well, I, you know, I'm in this group and they won't be able to do the project without me. So I'm going to sacrifice. And maybe that's motivating for them. Um, other students might be like, you know, I have some responsibility in this group. I have some power and control. And so that motivates me. I mean, different things will motivate different people, but it's just that connection that they make with other people and with the content and other things is, um, that's the important part of that level of the pyramid. If they don't have any connection at all in an online course, often they'll just drop out and not finish. Sort of depends on the context you're in. So, but also that so that connect that community connection is also the glue to keep them coming and to keep them part right. of the coherent. Course. If you think about MOOCs on Coursera, for example, students. There's no grade, there's no, you know, they're doing it for their own development. And, and so what would motivate them to keep coming? Well, it's going to be that connection. In an institution like ASU, in an online course, they're getting a grade, there's a degree attached to it, there's a little bit more to motivate them, the community might become a little bit less important then, but it's still, it's still an important part. And I think that's that's a nice point to us to to start to go to close because um, even I don't know if you've seen this, Justin, but in the text chat there, um, Alina says the ASU uh, TESOL course is the best. So you're obviously oh. pretty much getting something right there in terms of building that oh. fan base. Thank at you. Least.